All right. So now that we've developed the fundamental, we understand the fundamental properties of the MOS capacitor, we understand that we can actually control the density of charges, charge uh, carriers, free charge carriers on the surface. And particularly, we can actually use the process of inversion, which allows you to invert the nature of the charge carriers on the surface of the semiconductor. So if you had n-type material, you can actually turn it into p-type by inversion using that cap and vice versa. So that basically, that physical phenomenon by itself can be used now to, to make a device. Right? So now think about it. You have a surface whose conductivity or charge density you can control. Now if you can control the charge density, you can control the conductivity, right? And if you can control the conductivity, you can actually modulate it. And the good thing is that you can actually have a terminal, the gate terminal, that would allow you to do that. So let's construct a device based on this knowledge. So the device we are going to co construct is called a MOSFET. FET stands for Field Effect Transistor. Sometimes in shorthand we refer to it as MOS transistor or CMOS. CMOS is not really a transistor, it's a process, it's a complementary metal oxide semiconductor process. But a lot of times people refer to it as CMOS transistor. Fine. Or, but the more technically accurate name would be a field effect transistor. Because you're applying an electric field that would induce carrier concentration. So how do we do that? So let's think about it this way. So let's say you have the surface. And let's say this time we start with a p-type bulk. So the things that we've said about the n-type, the mass capacitor, it would just invert. Everything will invert, right? I mean, so to induce inversion charge, now you have to make apply a positive charge to the gate, which would repel the electron, the holes away, and eventually will form an electronic layer of inversion charge at the surface. So if you want to have, let's say you have a little gate oxide. Nowadays, it's very, very, very thin. And then you have the gate. Now, this is not the way a real MOSFET today looks like, the gate of a real MOSFET. The real MOSFET, and I will, well, let me draw the rest of it, and I will show you what kind of the cross section of it looks like. Uh, it's a little bit different, but we'll use the same thing because it essentially gives you the same physics. The, the drawing doesn't matter. Now, is this a transistor? So I have a gate. Let's say V gate. V, v some voltage here on the gate. Is this a transistor? No. Why? Yeah, you need a place to connect the actual resistance. So where is the place where we are actually modulating stuff? We're modulating the carrier concentration here. So it would make sense to have something on each side that will allow us to make contact to this thing. And it does actually more than that, we'll see. So what kind of doping should we put in there if you want to make a contact that allows you to make a contact, but it, it's a, something that can be turned on and off? Think about it this way. When it's on, what kind of channel am I forming when I do inversion in the p-type material? What kind of charge carriers will I have? Electrons, right, at, on the surface. And these electrons are basically, essentially you turn the surface into an n-type material. So if you want to make a ohmic contact to an n-type material, what kind of material would you use? N-type, right? So you basically put some n and n here. Now, if you think about it, you want these contacts to be as low resistivity as possible, because these contacts should not add resistance to the channel. So you can make them n plus or n plus plus. Pretty high concentration, right? So what happens is that now you apply an electric potential. But the other interesting thing that happens when you do that is that if you do not have a voltage that's sufficient to form an inversion, what do you have between here and there, if you think about it? What do you have here? What is this between, say again? Negative I. Yeah, correct. No, no, I'm saying that what kind of a device do you have? If I look at this locally between this N plus and this P bulk, it's a diode. It's the P junction diode, right? So you have two back to back diodes, if you think about it. Now, why does that matter? Because it's that in the absence of a channel, there will be no current conduction. So this transistor can be turned off 
if there's no inversion charge formed, you have two back-to-back -back dials, which doesn't carry that much current. So, so that's actually a good thing, because a useful device can be turned on and off. I mean, there are certain applications where you don't turn transistors off, for example, certain kind of classes of amplification and all those things, which is fine. So and in those cases, you can actually use constantly on transistors. But normally, you want the transistor to turn off. And that's why you introduce this. So OK, so one of these, you can see this is a symmetrical device, the way it's drawn. So we can define one of them as a reference potential. In this case, this one, we define it as, the, as ground. And we call this the source. And we'll see why it's called the source more accurately, because it's the source of the charge in the channel. Now, there is a, so now you apply a potential voltage, electric potential here, to the gate. So we call this VGS. Now everything is referenced with, so, to the source, because that's the ground. And then you have another electric potential here, VDS, the, the voltage between these two terminals. So one is the gate to the source, and the other one is the drain to the source. And actually, do you know what? If you think about this device, this is really not even a three terminal device. It's a four terminal device, exactly, right? Where is the fourth terminal? The bulk or the substrate. So there's another voltage here, which we call VSB, resource bulk, right? So there are four voltage, three voltages here, here, really, all defined with respect to the source. So what happens here is that in, in normal operation, if, 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 well, if, if before you apply a gate voltage, what do you have? You have depletion region formed here. A depletion region is formed here. So this is a depletion region formed in the p-type. And of course, this being n plus, most of the depletion is going to be on this end. Um, and what else? What else happens? Not much. If the VGS is below threshold, there's no inversion. You have some depletion, and that's the thing. But the one key question is that, what is the threshold voltage in terms of these voltages? Is it the same? Is it still the same VT0? You remember we defined this VT0. We found it to be the V flat band plus 2 phi f plus gamma square root of 2 phi f. Now, one thing I want you to remember is that which one, there were two things, right? One was the potential drop across the oxide, and one was the potential drop across the depletion region in the semiconductor, right? So which one is this? Is this the voltage across the semiconductor or the oxide? Semiconductor, right? By definition of the strong inversion. This came from the definition of strong inversion being that the surface potential needs to be such that the density of the charge carriers and the on the surface should be the same as that of the bulk, but of the opposite kind. So that meant that you had to go phi f to get to ei, the intrinsic level, and then another phi f to go to invert it, right? So this is the part in the semiconductor. And this is the part inside the oxide. Now, people get confused because the parameters of gamma are such that they look like the, the parameters of the depletion region. And that confuses people. But this, you have to make this distinction. This is the part of the oxide. This is the semiconductor part, and this is the oxide part. And this is where it becomes important, the discussion we are going to have in a second now. So what if you have a VSB, a source bulk voltage? Would that affect the threshold voltage? And how, if so? Would the source bulk voltage affect the threshold voltage? Threshold voltage? Would it change it? And why? Well, what would the V-source bulk do? Think about it. If I increase this voltage or decrease it, what, what, what is the thing that will change here? This depletion region, right? Because this is a PN junction. This really controls, that I'm controlling the, the reverse bias, if you will, of this PN junction. So if I apply a larger source bulk voltage, essentially I'm pushing, pushing this down, which basically means that I even extend the width of the depletion region. So what happens? So, so that my depletion region can become larger, for example, right? like that, or smaller. So I'm modulating the depletion with region width. So 
Now, this is a, a little bit of a tricky question, but I want you to think about it carefully. When I'm doing that, which one of these terms would be affected? It would affect one of these two terms. It wouldn't affect this, this because this is determined by some physical properties of the material and the charge we've implanted and things of that sort. One of these two will be affected. And which one do you think would be? The oxide part or the semiconductor part? The one on the right or the one on the left? Or the one, I guess, in the middle? So how many people think that this guy will be affected? OK. And how many people think that this one will be affected? OK. Let me ask you a question. What determines the value of this term? Where did this come from? Yes? Correct. It, it's defined in terms of the doping level of the constant. But it really came from, but you're right. But it really came from the definition of strong inversion. By definition of strong inversion, when we have this surface potential, we are in strong inversion. So if we define our threshold as the point where the strong inversion happens, then this cannot change. Because it's a definition of strong inversion, whatever the strong inversion is. So this is the one that will have to change. Now, how would it change? So when you apply this voltage, you're changing what the surface potential, the, 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 the amount of the depletion charge you have here. This will increase the electric field across the oxide. And that change in the electric field across the oxide makes it more slanted, which basically means that this term needs to be adjusted. You need more or less voltage on the gate to create the same condition on the surface. Does that make sense? So what it means is, from a practical standpoint, it means that this gets adjusted by VSP. So now, this is not VT0 anymore. This is VT. This is the threshold voltage. So that prime and zero went away. And this is the threshold voltage for a device. More often shown actually like this. So more frequently, it's shown as VT, as VT0 plus gamma times square root of 2 phi f plus VSB minus square root of 2 phi f. And you can see. This is basically a correction. It's a modification to VT0. So VT0 is a parameter that, for example, when you're designing, you're given for a transistor. So you can say, this transistor is designed or is made to have a VT of 0.6 volts, 0.4 volts, whatever you have. So it's going to have a VT0. But that VT is actually a function. The practical VT is changed by the voltage you apply to the source with respect to the bulk. So you, you actually are modulating the voltage. It's called actually the, it's called the body effect. Now, in fact, as we'll see later on, and we'll discuss this in more details later, there are really two transistors here in parallel. There are two transistors that are sharing the drain and source. One is your MOSFET. This field is controlling the channel, uh, the charge in the channel, the inversion charge. And there's a second controlling terminal, which is this bulk. It's called the body effect. And then you can actually, by controlling this, you can control, it's kind of more like a JFET, if you think about it. So you can think about it as a JFET in parallel with a MOSFET. And sometimes this is a bad thing. You're trying to get rid of it. Sometimes you can use it. And we'll see in circuits when we discuss the actual circuit design how this comes into play and when it's good and when it's bad and how we take it into account. But there's a second transistor really there, which is modulating a thing through modulating this parameter. It's not a very strong one, as you can see from that square root dependence, but it is there. And it can be a problem. The problem usually arises in circuit design when your source is not grounded. So you, if your source is moving, because this bulk you usually ground. But if your source is not at, at, a, at a point in the circuit, and a lot of times this happens, that it's actually connected to ground, then the, ch the potential difference between the source and the bulk will start modulating the threshold of the transistor through which the behavior of the circuit will be modulated. 
And that's that second back gate transistor. We call it the back gate transistor sometimes. So it's important to understand where it comes from. This is where it comes from. So that is the new modified threshold value for the transistor, right? So it will be found, and then this body effect is also visible in there, et cetera, et cetera. So that's good. So now let's see if we can actually find a, a first order expression, at least. Start with the first order expression for the current in the transistor, and we'll, we'll refine it and make it more accurate. So what if, so after all these things, you have some threshold. OK, fine. Now you're forming a channel. You, you form a channel when you apply a, a gate voltage. So now first assume that VDS is very small. VDS, very small. So the question is, what is the current flowing, let's call it I drain, or I transistor, which will be flowing out of here, as a function of VGS and other parameters in the circuit? How do we find that? How do we find that current? Well, really to think about this, we have to really turn this into a three-dimensional structure. I mean, we have to see the three-dimensional structure fully. Um, so let's make it three-dimensional. So let's say this length, this length is called, this is L. And this is the width of the transistor W. OK? And now it's a three-dimensional device. So how much charge do I have in the channel? How much charge do I form in the channel? If I have a voltage of VGS. Well, we talked about the inversion charge, right? We said strong inversion charge to inversion was C ox gate oxide per unit area, VGS minus VT. Now we can use this VT. So that's the charge in the channel. Okay. Now, how long does it take an average electron? Because electrons start from the source, and that's why it's called the source, because it's a source of charge carriers. If you had a PFET, which is the opposite of this thing, is P plus inside an N-type um, well or substrate, then what happens is that you will have holes. So the holes are, when you apply a voltage, are coming from here. Now, this is one fundamental difference between a MOSFET and a MOS cap. You remember we said that the charge, the inversion charge in a MOS cap, where did it come from? It came from the thermal generation, right? And hence, it was a very slow process. If we were to account, if we were to use or count on that process, MOSFETs would have never been used as extensively as they are because they would have been very slow and none of the major electronic devices that you carried you would have happened. That charge has to come from somewhere. Now you ha it's different. The situation is different. Now you have actually a very large supply of these charges. Where do they come from, the inversion charges? In this case, they would be electrons, right? Is a P type. Yes, from these two guys. There's a massive supply of electrons right next door. So you apply the voltage, right? You apply a positive voltage here, you start attracting negative charge. But they are not thermally generated charge. They are just coming from, they pour in from these two, the, the drain and source. Because you have a ton of them there. So they form a channel. And the charge in this channel is this. Let's say, this, that's the, so that's Q inversion density. So the Q is going to be WL, the area, times that aerial charge density. So that would be the charge, the net charge in Coulomb. Now, to determine the current approximately, what do I need to do? It's going to be this charge divided by the time it takes an average electron to get from this side to that side, right? What is that time? What is the time it takes an average electron to go from one side to the other? Well, the time it takes to travel the distance L is the distance divided by the velocity. So what kind of velocity should I put there? I kind of gave you a clue, of course. But the drift velocity. No, why the drift velocity and not the thermal velocity? 
Because this movement is induced by what? What is inducing this volt movement? What is make? The electric field. And that electric field is induced by this voltage, right? So you apply a little bit of voltage here. So this becomes more positive than that. So the electrons are attracted across here. So this is a field-induced electric field, uh, movement, ele electronic movement. A field-induced electronic movement or electron movement. So it's a drift velocity. So what is that drift velocity? We know the drift velocity, we had an expression. In low field conditions, the drift velocity was proportional to the electric field inside a semiconductor, right? We discussed this. So, and that proportionality constant was called what? Mobility. So it's mu and E. So what is the electric field? Let's say, let's say it's uniform now. Let's say, I mean, we'll get to the non-uniform soon. But this is, let's say it's uniform. So you have applied the voltage DS. So this voltage is VDS. What is the electric field inside if it was uniform? It's VDS divided by L. L, right? So L divided by mu, VDS divided by L. So it's L squared over mu n VDS. So that's the time, that's the average transit time for electron. So that's the average, it takes an average, the time it takes an average electron due to drift to get from here to there or the average velocity of the electronic gas that's induced by inversion, right? We have inverted the surface, and then that's... So now I think that we know, how, we know everything we need, right? We, we, so we divide these two, which next is algebra. Divided by L squared divided by mu and VDS. So one of these L's cancel, so you get mu n C ox W over L VGS minus VT times VDS. Now, this, remember, this is still for small VDSs. So what do we have? If you think about it, if you look at the Ohm's law, it's actually, in this region, it looks like a resistor. There is a current that's proportional to the voltage across these two terminals, VDS. But it's a resistor whose value is controlled by what? by the controlling terminal, the VGS. So you can actually modulate this resistance. You can change it. And that's why it's called the transistor, trans resistor. This is really the closest it comes to what the name transistor suggests. Invented by Julius Lilienfeld. <laughs> Um, I should, uh, next time I'll make copies of, uh, as a handout of the three patents of Julian Lilienfeld, Julius Lilienfeld. They are very clear. There's no ambiguity. 1920. Okay. MOSFET, MESFET, and JFET, all three of them, three patents. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. By the way, Bell Labs paid, this is an interesting story, Bell Labs paid an undisclosed amount to Julius Lilienfeld when they had the big announcement for the transistor that Shockley, Barden, and all those things invented. Um, and they paid if, an undisclosed amount to Julius Lilienfeld. So at least he got something out of it. So he doesn't make any noise about it. But it's in the record. Just go to the patent office, type Julius Lilienfeld. You will, you will, it pops up, all three of them. Anyway, so. This is the basic transistor. So now what we need to do is the next, the next step for this is really to turn this into a more elaborate equation. So what we'll do next, we'll see that as VDS increases, this uniformity assumption for the charge will break. And what we'll do next is to break it into small segments as opposed to one giant piece and by doing it into an infinite, breaking it into an infinitesimal pieces and integrating across that, we come up with a nonlinear expression for the current versus voltage. And we'll see that there are two regions of operation. This is what we call a triad region, or linear region, or ohmic region. And there will be another region which we'll call pinch-off region for operation of the MOSFET. And we'll see where they come from, and we'll see what the impacts are on the device and behavior of that. Um, 
OK, that's, so that's for that. Uh, any questions? All right, that's good.